This is an island with free food. Pick up these crabs and eat as much as you want. There are so many of them, it's impossible to drive down the road and not crush a few. A few? Look at them, they're everywhere. You can earn some decent cash by selling these crabs. Surprisingly, no one seems to be doing it. Nobody's even picking up this free food that just scuttles right under feet. Today, you'll learn where the most expensive and tasty crabs on the planet live, why fishermen are looking for crabs in soft shells despite authorities putting a ban on it, what people are willing to do to save a completely inedible species, and which crab is equally good in a soup and as a mass murderer. Let's get started. Better ask Steve. Imagine you walk outside one morning and you see that. Crabs. Crabs everywhere. But if you think this is a lot of crabs, you're wrong. This is a lot of crabs. And you can see this scene on almost every street, everywhere you go. If you don't know exactly what's going on, you'd think the crab apocalypse has begun. Or perhaps an invasion of zombie crabs. How else can you explain millions of animals emerging from the ground and then marching through the island like the living dead? They can't be stopped by cars, people, or any other obstacles. These crabs have a goal they're striving for, and everything else becomes unimportant. And if you just stand and watch, everything around you, as far as the eye can see, becomes teeming with red with tiny swarming bodies. You can't even walk without stepping on at least one of them. There's no place for humans here. Check out how many of these crabs there are. Picture this happening on a crowded street. When the crab wave pulls back, it's like they've left behind a road covered in the bodies of their fallen family members. It looks like a massacre, seriously. This craze takes a toll on countless crabs annually. Thousands are struck by cars and others risk dying from dehydration when exposed to the blazing sun. Look at this guy, or girl, that crab. He's running as fast as he can barely stay alive. And that's only because people try to drive slowly as the crab apocalypse unfolds around them. Do you know what those dark, already motionless spots on the road are? I think you can guess. Over the course of a few weeks, this is happening many more times. But the interesting thing is that people are, uh, don't mind what's happening. There's this army of spider-like critters crawling all over the roads, but it's like nobody's bothered. Drivers aren't trying to squash them, no one's stepping on them, and there's no insect spray in sight. And it's not just because bug repellent won't do a thing against these crabs. On the contrary, people come from all over the world to see the crab apocalypse. Crab apocalypse, if you will, with their own eyes. And the locals spend tons of money and time to help the crabs reach their destination. But seriously, what's going on here? Red land crabs prefer a solo lifestyle, spending the majority of their time digging through soil and leaves in search of food. They make their homes in burrows or deep rock crevices, embracing the bachelor lifestyle. Most of the year, crabs chill in their homes, just living life day by day. But when the heavy rain starts in October or November, you won't believe what happens. Suddenly, millions and millions of adult red crabs are on the move, leaving their cozy abodes behind. At first glance, it seems like they're an offensive army marching towards the coast. But the crabs have a different goal. They're making their way to the water to mate. All this crab madness is happening on Christmas Island, 930 miles away from mainland Australia and 217 miles south of the Indonesian island of Java. The red land crab is Christmas Island's key species. You could say it's mascot. Not surprisingly, the entire local community embraces the crabs. They're as iconic as spaghetti in Italy, except you don't eat them. More on that later. To prepare for the massive annual crab migration, people spend months of their time, plus a whole lot of money, to set up miles of temporary roadside barriers. Installing barriers helps guide crabs away from roads, preventing them from getting squished by cars. By directing the crabs towards safe crossings, like underpasses and overpasses, we've seen the red land crab population more than double in the last five years, from 50 million to over 100 million. And you can just imagine how wild it is to see millions of crabs marching around the island. The incredible part is the noise. Imagine millions of tiny feet tapping away. Once you hear it, you won't be able to get it out of your head. It goes on, tap, 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 day and night, loud and clear. All people can do is help the crabs get to their destination. That's why rangers from Christmas Island National Park built 31 underpasses on the island. Check it out, there are these safe passages under the roads. Besides those, like I mentioned earlier, they made about 12 miles of barriers to stop crabs from getting onto the roads. But several years ago, they found this one spot where tunnels just wouldn't work, so they put up a bridge. Yep, a bridge, just for the crabs. 
Why not? Sydney may have the Harbor Bridge and San Francisco the Golden Gate Bridge, but the tiny Crab Bridge attracts just as many tourists from all over the world. Although, come to think of it, for us, the bridge is tiny, but from the crab's point of view, it's as tall as a skyscraper. Good thing crabs aren't afraid of heights, I think. Now let's see what the migration looks like up close. Not that close, Steve. Get up. So altogether, it takes about three months. First, the male crabs meet the females on shore. Near the shore, the males dig special family burrows for the females to lay their eggs. After setting up comfy homes for their potential offspring, the males head back into the woods, leaving the females and future baby crabs to hide in the burrows. After 12 or 13 days of brooding their eggs and with the arrival of the waning moon, the female red crabs make their way to the sea. Not to take a swim, though, they're just releasing their eggs into the water. And it looks like this. The black mass under their bellies are eggs that are ready to go swimming. These funky motions aren't some groovy dance, they're just the way crabs release their babies. Adding a disco ball would be a fun touch, though. When they enter the water, the tiny crabs hatch almost right away. However, they spend another month at sea going through various larval stages. Only a handful manage to survive the tough ocean currents and predators in the sea. The ones that do survive begin their journey back to the rainforest, contending with predators like yellow crazy ants along the way. So the crabs just keep scuttling back and forth on the island. First the grown-ups, then the little ones, and it just keeps happening over and over again. No wonder people are used to a bunch of crabs constantly scuttling somewhere nearby. Although, you know that's actually quite surprising, because the annual migration causes locals enough inconvenience. People not only have to look out for crabs by blocking roads, driving cautiously, and building things to keep them safe, but there's also the risk of the crabs causing accidents. Their tough exoskeletons can even puncture tires. Plus, crabs really don't care where they go. When they're on the move, you might spot them not just on the roads, but also in unexpected places like schools, offices, grocery stores, or even your own kitchen or closet. There's a chance you could accidentally step on one in the dark, too. So it turns out people just have to deal with these crabs. According to the Parks Australia Agency, these crabs play a key role in maintaining the island's rich biodiversity. Their job of chowing down on fallen leaves ensures the forest floor stays healthy. The crabs are reducing the number of flies on the island, plus their burrowing helps the soil get more oxygen, making it richer and more fertile. Simply put, if the red crabs disappear, the island won't survive in the long run. People don't really have a choice here. And I'm not exaggerating. There are places on the island where crabs die during migration so often that they simply do not return to the forest. People have noticed that as crab populations decline, the forest loses its diversity. Also, where crabs vanish, invasive species thrive. Okay, okay, I get it. Crabs are very important to the island. But come on, crab meat is delicious, a real delicacy. And these guys are just wandering around? Why not scoop them up and throw them in a bag with a shovel? Yes, crabs need to reproduce to maintain the ecosystem, but then why not catch them on the way back when the job's done? Once the little ones are out there in the ocean, why not make a meal out of the grown-ups? Well, here's the thing. Crabs are pretty small, yet their bodies have a lot of water in them, and the meat is, well, not top-notch. I mean, it's 96% water. It's like eating a dishwashing sponge, just crab-flavored. And by the way, red land crabs don't even taste like regular crabs. That's why people don't eat them. If you're thinking about starting a business with them, you'd have to catch and clean a bunch of crabs. Otherwise, you won't have enough meat to sell. As a result, you'll end up with more waste than from the crabs we're used to eating. It's a lot of work for very little payoff. And the meat doesn't taste good either. Red crabs might not be everyone's favorite, especially for humans, but yellow crazy ants beg to differ. Around the start of the 20th century, these ants unintentionally ended up on Christmas Island from Africa. In their new home, they seamlessly integrated and now create super colonies spanning hundreds of acres with billions of members. They also destroy red crabs in huge quantities. Scientists believe that yellow crazy ants have killed 10 to 15 million red crabs in recent years. That's a quarter to one third of the total population. Even though crabs have tough shells, ants effortlessly crawl over them, releasing formic acid onto the crab's eyes and leg joints. The acid paralyzes the crab, preventing it from escaping no matter how hard it tries, and eventually it becomes a meal for the ants. Surprisingly, ants don't seem to mind the taste of crab meat. So here's the deal. Crabs play a vital role in keeping the island alive but ants wipe out large numbers of them. You see the problem here? But people seem to have come up with a solution. They're going to bring a tiny wasp from Malaysia known as Tacardia ephigus somervelle to the island. The idea is that it'll compete with ants for food, but do much less damage. 
Ideally, there will be fewer ants and they'll do less damage to the crabs, but I have my doubts about that. Usually, when people bring in some new species to help them, things only get worse. Remember cane toads? They were brought to Australia to fight the insects, but instead, now of Australia has to fight the toads. And so far, the toads are winning. In Hawaii, they tried to use mongooses to control rats, but they didn't take into account that mongooses are active during the day and rats are active at night. The only thing that makes me feel a little better is that the species were introduced without proper research in both cases. I'd like to believe that people have since started to learn from their mistakes. With wasps, it seems like scientists did their homework. They assure us that the newcomers won't bother anything or anyone they shouldn't and won't attack the island's important creatures. Let's wait and see. And while we're on the subject of mainland Australia, what's up with the crabs there? Turns out they're facing their own crab apocalypse. Every winter, thousands of local spider crabs appear in the shallow waters off the southern coast. They form huge underwater piles, some as tall as a man. And frankly, it looks kind of creepy. It's like any moment now, this thing might just start moving towards you, knock you down, and who knows, maybe eat you. There can be over 50,000 crabs in these clusters. I don't even want to think about how people arrived at this figure. What's really exciting about this whole thing is that the crabs are about to, well, grow bigger. Yep, they're planning on shedding their old chitinous shells, so for a bit, the crabs are going to be pretty vulnerable. Oh, by the way, we've got another video on this. If you haven't checked it out, make sure to watch it next. So all these crabs molt at the same time, in about an hour. After that, they just stay together for a few days, waiting for their new shells to toughen up. Many people think that crabs gather in large groups to ensure safer molting. Thousands upon thousands of crabs come together in shallow waters and beneath man-made piers, which offers them added protection from various predators like stingrays, small sharks, birds, octopuses, and other crabs. Breaking away from the crowd might be a death sentence for crabs. The stingray spits out just the crab's empty shell, all that's left of the crab. I gotta say that scientists are making an educated guess here. They're not completely certain. Giant spider crabs have recently been spotted gathering along the shores of Victoria and Tasmania, but there are tons of questions and no answers. How many spider crabs are there? How many of them gather in groups? How long do the crabs stay together? Scientists are so puzzled that they're asking ordinary people for help. If anyone happens to see crabs alone, in bunches, or just an empty shell lying around, they're asked to report that to Spider Crab Watch. Listen, this is the same thing as with red land crabs, a bunch of animals in one place, so why not collect them and use them as food? Should be easy enough. The red crabs kinda hit the jackpot because they aren't tasty, while the spider crabs aren't so lucky since they're considered a delicacy. That's why people seize the chance to gather some crabs when they're all in one place. People catch crabs right where they hide from predators, under artificial piers. For example, the 2019-2020 spider crab season was marked by a huge catch. Crabs were pulled out of the water by the thousands every day. In 2020, only a handful of crabs hanging out under the piers on the Mornington Peninsula could molt properly due to some issues. Most of them got pulled out neatly. Animal rights activists are expressing concern about the well-being of crabs and are currently advocating for a petition to prohibit the catching of these creatures during molting. Catching crabs is perfectly fine since humans have been doing it for ages. The problem comes up when crabs gather in huge numbers. You can't hunt them at this time, unless we're okay with causing irreparable damage to the entire crab population. What's fascinating is that dolphins stepped up as bodyguards for crabs, although hardly intentionally. A few years back in Western Australia, fishermen realized their crab traps were getting raided and the bait was gone. The crabs were nowhere to be found. People thought it was fishy, so they put up cameras and found out that dolphins were just snagging their bait before the crabs could even get to it. It's a big deal even for creatures as smart as dolphins. Crab traps are used in many places, but nowhere else have dolphins managed to figure out how to crack them open and steal the goodies, and all with just their noses. But there's more to the story. When the crab catchers placed the bait under the trap instead of on top, the dolphins, well, did this. Yep, they promptly realized that the trap needed to be flipped over. And guess what? They came out on top again. Another type of Australian crab known as Tabuca flamula belongs to the family of fiddler crabs. These crabs inhabit an area stretching from Mangrove Bay in Western Australia all the way up north. Fiddler crabs prefer living in sandy or muddy environments where sand is abundant. They're commonly spotted or along the edges of mangroves and pose no threat despite residing in large colonies.
Grown-up male crabs stand out with their striking features, a single large claw. Typically, they use it in combat with other males, reserving the smaller claw for everyday crab activities. That's why they're called fiddler crabs. When they wiggle that big claw, it looks like they're playing the violin, or so the scientists say. But think about this. Male fiddler crabs have one claw that's much bigger than the other, making up to 40% of their total weight. Interestingly, it's the claws that they use for grabbing food. Can you see what I'm getting at here? In the south of Portugal, people enjoy eating the big claw of the fiddler crab uca tangeri as a local delicacy. Fishermen remove the large claw from the male crab and toss it back into the mud because these crabs can regrow their claws regularly, not just in emergencies like lizards do, but before each time they shed their shell. When they looked at the population in that place, it turned out that about 38% of the sampled males had missing or regenerated claws. And given that fiddler crabs are not difficult to catch, it's just a potentially endless source of crab meat. Though, of course, in real life, things are much more complicated. First of all, crabs employ their claws to charm females into their burrows for mating. If a crab has no claw, females won't pay any attention to such a male. Next, the big claw serves as a weapon during scuffles with other males. It's not just about one-on-one -on -one combat. Males also protect their burrows from competing crabs. This puts a crab with a small claw at a disadvantage. Also, growing a new claw is quite a task for a crab. It requires a bunch of resources and energy. It's way tougher for a crab to survive without a claw compared to those with one. But I guess that's pretty obvious. Oh, and Steve here tells me that sometimes a crab growing a new claw starts bluffing. This happens if the old claw is prematurely lost during the molt. When regeneration occurs, the regenerated claw may look the same size as the original, but it's physically weaker. As a result, these guys need to tweak their battle strategies to secure a victory. Check out this dude. His claw might not be the strongest, but he waves it around so much that hardly anyone would guess. It's like his go-to move at the beginning of a fight, trying to make the other guy back off by being intimidating. And surprisingly, crabs pull this off. But we haven't talked about all the crabs yet. Meet the European green crab. It lives on the Atlantic coast of Europe and in northern Africa. On the map, its habitat is marked in blue. But these are its factory settings, so to speak. The species is already successfully spread around the world to North America, Japan, South Africa, Australia, in short, everywhere marked in red. By the way, the yellow areas on the map are the areas where this invasive species will emerge in the near future. But back to Australia. Records show that European green crabs were first spotted there in 1900 in Port Phillip Bay. Since then, the crabs have spread in different directions. They've been found in Tasmania, Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia, and New South Wales. Most likely, the original European green crabs were stowaways that were brought along with European stones. These stones were used as semi-dry ballast on English ships, and the crabs just hitched a ride. Who could have predicted that they'd become such a nuisance, exhibiting all the typical behaviors of invasive species? The European green crab has had a negative effect on local species and aquaculture because it turns out to be a really hungry predator that eats, well, pretty much anything of the right size. This situation isn't good news. The European green crab causes a lot of trouble. It even hurts people because it goes after clams and mussels. It wreaks havoc on farms and doesn't have any natural enemies or rivals. With its killer appetite, anything in its path becomes fair game, from other crabs and fish to young lobsters. I already mentioned clams. No one can handle the powerful claws of an invasive crab or its appetite. See for yourself. It's pretty common for a single crab to dig up and chow down on up to 40 small clams in a day. Plus, crabs aren't bothered at all by changes in water temperature, oxygen levels, or salt content. They're like the ultimate survivors, thriving in all sorts of environments. You can see that just by checking out their wide range. Of course, this begs the question, why don't we eat them all? Instead of simply trying to get rid of European green crabs, some folks are considering a different approach, turning them into a meal. Fishermen and chefs are slowly warming up to the idea of cooking and serving European green crabs. Why not? There are many of them, and they're essentially seafood. Because of their small size, the best way to cook green crabs is to eat them whole when they haven't yet grown a hard shell. That is, you have to catch crabs that have recently molted and have not yet had time to harden. And it looks quite delicious. Another option is to make a broth from the crustacean. Currently, this is the most common and simple method of using green crabs in cooking because finding recently molted crabs takes time, but you can always boil any crab. 
Regardless of how you cook them, green crabs are a delicious alternative to other crab species. Simply put, they're edible, and you should definitely consider giving them a try. Surprisingly, we haven't seen any Australian chefs experimenting with them. Maybe it's time for them to consider the idea. European green crabs can be used to make something unexpected. Whiskey. In the small town of Tamworth, New Hampshire, there's a distillery that seems quite ordinary. Just like any other whiskey distillery. But what's surprising is what they use as the base ingredient. The whiskey infused with the unique flavor of European green crab is crafted from four-year-old bourbon and over 88 pounds of these crabs. Wondering how someone thought of this? The distillery owner credits the inspiration to Asian cuisine, particularly the use of fish sauce. See you later!